Do you want to share my screen real quick, or I'll share my screen? I'm just going to show you the um, the great circle route thing I was telling you about yesterday. I'm uh, sure. Hang on just a second. got to switch all these buttons here. Now I can zoom down here. Share screens. Okay. You should be seeing it. Oops. Here. All right. I see. Uh, I see Google Earth. Okay. So you know how if we draw any line from you know somewhere, this is the Great Circle route supposedly. So if you're going to fly from here to here, this is the Great Circle route. Or if you were going to go, you know, L.A. to over here. So it always draws this yellow Great Circle route. And I was just looking at when you go down to the equator. And let's say we're in Ecuador, and we're going to fly all the way to, say, over here somewhere. Okay. So you'll notice that my, my, great, oh, don't, my great circle route is the equator here. Now, as I start to move just a few miles, so from here it's the, great, it's the equator, but then as I just start to take my location up a little bit, look how the great circle route is changing so that by the time I'm here, you know, how, how much did I move? And I'm already, now the great circle route is instead of the equator is way up here. And then if I just move it a little bit more, then now I'm going over the North Pole. So I was kind of confused as to why that would be happening. Why could this distance change cause my Great Circle route to change so drastically? But then if you look at the Flat Earth map and you actually draw that line between um, Ecuador and one of these locations, as you go up, it's just a straight line shot. I would have to pull up a Flat Earth map. But... You know, it's just a, it's just like your line is moving slightly to the right. It's a straight shot and moving slightly to the right, whereas this is making it look so drastic. So I always find things like that interesting, um, you know, as far as the Great Circle route and the way that it seems like every plane that leaves um, the United States and goes Europe, you know, if we go here and we're flying to Europe, usually the Great Circle route is, you know, up by the, there we go, so, you know, up by Greenland. You know stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I just always have found the great circle routes. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're they're always mathematical, uh, meaning you be able to figure out what is the quickest um, path between two locations on a sphere. Because it should be a great circle route is basically like you, um, what, what it's like. A, uh, you, you chop it in half, right? You chop a a sphere in sphere half. In half, right? And then that path that is the uh, so there's only basically one great circle route I would think between two locations. Well, I think what it is 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 basically you've got the the map which has already been turned into a sphere, and then you have the great circle route which takes this arced route around it. So you know it's basically kind of you're arcing an arc and and coming back with the same results. Let's go to 90 degrees. You know, are heading 90 degrees. So which would be there and a little bit left. Okay, there. So that's. Uh, 90 degrees to my east from here. So you would think if you went here and went 90 degrees to the west, I'm sorry, 270 to the west, that you would go back to the same spot. But no, actually 270 west is here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people need to start looking at this and realizing it's not what you think it is. And I know this is something, a mistake I even made, you know, at first when we were talking about, you know, if somebody's at the, say, 50 degrees north latitude, if they fly east, a lot of people think that they would just continue around and come back to where they started. And that's only true on the equator. That, you know, anywhere else, if you flew east, um, you would not come back to where you started. And, but you, well, you would, but you wouldn't go on a latitude line. You know, for instance, like if somebody here is on the west east coast of the United States and they're looking east, if I said, you know, to David or somebody who lives over there, hey, what's east? They would think something like this is over east. You know, because mm -hmm. that's what we think. But actually, 90 degrees east is this is here. So right. when they're looking east, they're looking at Central Africa. And if you were to even go further at 90 degrees east, um, you're talking about going underneath Australia. See, right? That's still not 90. That's 90 right there. So, I mean, that's just something that I don't think anybody in the east coast thinks. That if they're looking dead east, they're staring underneath Australia. Oh, yeah. Well, and there's another thing that, that I've kind of thought about, too. It's like, you know, say we just went through another equinox, right? Um, and right. Uh, supposedly this is when um, the sun is yeah, basically over the top of the equator, correct? And right. at, this, at this point, everybody in the world from north to south should be able to see the sun rise in the east and set in the west. But if you're on a ball and you're in North America, right? And here I am in Colorado and I'm at like 39 degrees uh, north uh, uh, latitude. Right. So how is it? How could I possibly look 
to the east and see sunrise and look to the west and see sunset when the sun is clearly south of me, right, and, and never goes right. between, never goes beyond the two tropics, right? That that has always boggled my mind. That just doesn't make any sense. And so, right. It, but it's if you go to go to Denver and then draw your line east, what you're actually looking at is the equator. Right. Precisely. You're, that's 90 degrees right there. So you, you're watching, if you spin this around and come from the perspective of you in Colorado, um, you know, if you're looking off this way, and again, on a short scale, you wouldn't even notice it. But if you're on this scale, then that's why you're looking east and seeing the sunrise. But you're actually looking at the equator, not technically east, which we think of like the lines of latitude as being what would be east. So, you know, what that means that a lot of people don't know is that even on a on a globe, if you... Because I've heard people say, oh, oh, the flat earthers think a plane is turning, that it's adjusting all every so often, it's turning. Well, that's what they do anyway. It that's is. Exactly it absolutely is. Because so, that, that's one of the things that you have to correct for. You know, when you're flying east or west, you will, they, they call it gyroscope drift, right? But what's mm -hmm. actually happening is the gyroscope is true. It is actually dead reckoning. It is the magnetic north reading that has changed. And so what you have to do is constantly adjust that uh, uh, gyro uh, to agree with the compass, right? So Correct. absolutely that's what you're doing. You know, if you were to dead reckon it, then you would stay absolutely on what the gyro says and trust it, right? Especially with these new, uh, you know, ring laser gyros. And where you're going to wind up at is, you know, somewhere south, right, on, on the flat earth map. So, right. you know, the fact that they say if you just, if you dead reckon east, you're going to wind up in the same place, um, that is absolutely not true. Not, not at all. And this is, right. you know, what you're demonstrating here is, is showing that very same principle. You know, why is it, again, you know, you, why is east really um, southeast and why is west really southwest when you're in the northern hemisphere? And, you know, same thing with the sun on the equinoxes or, or any time for that matter. Um, even if you were on a solstice and you're still above that tropic, then how could the sun ever even remotely come close to being east when it's clearly south of east or west, right? So it's a big, yep. big, big illusion, and people don't really seem to to catch on no, to I it. No, I think that's when you were talking about Wolfie earlier and saying that um, you know he, he doesn't see that. Of course, the azimuthal isn't going to work with the you know with the globe model. Well, <clears throat> the other thing is they have to then look at it and say, is it possible that we could be fooled? And I see so often that you know people just think, uh, that, for instance, that article that you're going to show in a little bit talking about the top five reasons <laughs> or top five ways to show flat earthers that the earth is a ball. One of those, they say, is time zones prove a sphere, that you live on a sphere. And, and that's just people not being able to think outside the box because that's what we've all been told, that you know uh, time zones prove that the earth is a sphere. It couldn't work any other way, but all, all you need is a smaller sun and a closer sun, and then it works fine. And same thing with you know the the Aristophanes experiment that uh, everybody wants to bring up, which they say proves that the Earth is a sphere, which it doesn't. It doesn't prove the Earth is a sphere because the same thing would happen if the Earth was, uh, I mean, if the Sun was close and smaller. So it's just little things like that that we have to think other possibilities or at least think, is it possible I've been fooled? A lot of people think there's no way they could be fooled, that, um, you know, we've predicted eclipses and the eclipses are predicted perfectly by the globe and therefore the globe must be true. Well, they don't think to themselves, well, what if the Earth was flat and people figured out how eclipses work and then created a globe model around it and said, hey, these globe, these eclipses are predicted only because of the globe model. They don't even think that that's a possibility, that that's, you know, a direction that it could have gone. And I just think, again, there's so much evidence that if you look at it and look, when was it, when did all these things come out? How long did we know these things? And what about old books? Everything draws to the conclusion, at least for me, that it's something we definitely need to look into because... You know, these things started to come about at the same time the printing press came about. So if you were going to pass a lie to the whole world, um, what better way to do it than when the book started to be printed to print your lie and call it fact. And, and then you're going to have everybody, um, you know, basically operating around that general foundational statement. And that's why, you know, a lot of people like to make fun of, I always go back to George Ellis's quote, I go back to Edwin Hubble's quotes. But these are because these guys um, voiced exactly what was going on that they were making philosophical decisions. And we as people who respect scientists, or at least respect what they say, need to understand that there's other models 
that can explain the observations. It just so happens they decided on a model for us, and then they've built everything upon that. So at that point, we have to look at it and say, well, if they were wrong, would they go back? And I mean, you really need to think about that. If science was wrong about evolution, if science was wrong about the age of dinosaurs, if science was wrong about the shape of the earth, would science go back and say, oops, we messed up, this is the actual truth? Well, you know, the answer is no. At this point, they couldn't because they've come across as we know everything, we're very smart, we do things through observations, we do things the scientific method. So once they accidentally messed up or, or did it on purpose, I don't know either one, regardless, they would have to tell the lie in order to keep science where it is. Because if it came out that dinosaurs were 30,000 years old, what would that do to people's opinions of science? Right. Well, you know, to be a little more fair to science, okay, um, because obviously I'm a believer in science and uh, have spent my life in engineering and pilot, and, and I, I love science and I love technical things. But so I don't think that it's so much that science uh, would be against admitting they're wrong or, or specifically the scientific community within science. However, the thing that, that holds them back is the very same thing that holds people back from, you know, declaring their observations of a flat earth. Um, if you go against this community, this norm, uh, it is an absolute agenda to ridicule you out, to cut your funding, um, to do everything in their power to any individual that stands against the system. Now, the system at the top is controlled by the, the very same elite um, that have financed all of the schools, right? Uh, or at least a great majority of them, and have definitely set the curriculum. And this is, you know, this is why even people that were trained in this very system that come up with very viable um, explanations for things and alternatives, um, they are petrified to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this works, you know, even as ridiculous as gravity is, look at, and look at all the people, all the scientific community that has come out with an alternative model that doesn't have to worry so much about, you know, funding or anything like that. Um, and yet they're never even given the time of day because this is controlled at the very top levels. So, I mean, I think it's a little unfair to just generalize and say science in general, um, when I think there's a lot of good people in the scientific community and engineering community um, that are simply too gun shy to come up with any proposition the different uh, that's different because of ridicule and uh, funding cuts and loss of jobs or I mean you know look what happened to Lydia and, and you know there's yeah <laughs> uh, it just that's just the way it is and that's really the stronghold that they have so uh, that's the only thing yeah, that I, I have against that so yeah and I agree with you I, and I don't mean to put them in a bad light but I mean also I look at it and say that if you got into the scientific um, industry or you, you're into science for some reason, whether you're a scientist or an engineer or whatever, you know, I would think that those people got into that line of work because they understood and appreciate the uh, difference between um, belief and faith and the difference between evidence and fact and uh, measurable results. And so whenever, if they ever see that there's a case where something is not being handled in that way, you know, I would hope those people would speak up first and foremost, and I don't think that that happens nowadays, and I agree with you. It's because of the pressure put on from above. Um, you know, I just did a video last week about um, dinosaurs, and, and you know, the, these are PhD scientists that are testing dinosaur bones and coming back with dates of, you know, 19,000 to 39,000 years, and, you know, that should be the kind of groundbreaking science um, because it's been predicted. People say it was predicted. We make models off it. You know, people predicted that the the uh, carbon-14 in dinosaur bones would be the norm, not the uh, anomaly. And it is the norm. Now that they're going back and checking all these bones, they are seeing that there's carbon-14 in them, which means that they're relatively recent. So you would think that um, when these scientists put out these papers, well, they're immediately shunned and they're immediately put down and told that they're wrong, uh, that dinosaur bones are clearly you know, 67 million years or older. <clears throat> and so then they have no choice but to just either conform to the norm and, and that the only problem I have with that is that these are scientists and so if they are okay with that well then I hope they know the damage that they're doing uh, to the world because the world respects science as it should as a way to get closer to the truth um, I think it's the best way to get closer to the truth the scientific method is the way to get to the truth but when you have people at the top that will squash real science in favor of dogmatic science 
um, or foundational science, axiomatic science, then you have a problem. And that's what I think is going on in science now, is you're not allowed to speak out and say, like Lydia did, or like we're saying, uh, that something's wrong with the model, because they won't even look at it. And that's the problem with you know, peer review, is it's not like what people think. People think that there's some sort of uh, double check method going on, and it's just, you know, it's not the way it works. If you're talking about, you know, uh, Neil deGrasse talking about, oh, there's a rival scientist who, he checks my work. Well, when somebody does evolutionary science or does dinosaur bone digging, nobody's double checking that work because there's no paleontologist that doesn't believe that dinosaurs are 67 million years old. So, and even if he did think that maybe they're not, well, then when he's putting a paper forward saying, hey, I dated this and it came back at 39,000 years, well, they're immediately outcasted. And so the the industry of science, I guess, is the problem, not the individuals. It's the whole atmosphere around it that is severely flawed. And it, it, we're going to see huge changes in the next 50 years, whether people realize it or not, because I do think more of these people are going to speak out and stop um, just bowing down to the to the the powers that shouldn't be. Yeah. Well, you know, th that's the thing. I mean, the scientists, um, the, you're, you're right. They're afraid, um, and the engineers, they're afraid because they certainly, yeah, after spending probably nearly six figures on an education, um, they certainly know the difference between a nice, cushy job uh, that, that has a nice income and therefore being able to have the nice luxuries in life and a nice house and all that versus uh, unemployment and ridicule, right? Uh, but what, what I find amazing is it goes even beyond those disciplines. For example, case in point, I mean, look at, at what Lydia went through with a psychologist, right, that, that she had to go to. Um, and the psychologist didn't even want to hear, you know, why she was sent there or why she was saying the things that she was sending. They, absolutely no interest whatsoever. And, and to me, that's, that's ridiculous because if, if somebody was being sent to me and I was a psychiatrist or a psychologist, the first thing that I would want to know is I would want to understand the mechanism of her thinking um, to be able to identify any delusional characteristics, right? Um, so, I mean, this is, this is the core of, of psychological... Um, uh, you know, practice, but instead what she got was, um, I don't even want to hear it. Right. And why is that? Uh, because of the level, level of criticism or are they afraid that maybe she's going to make sense and they won't know how to answer that or whatever. So, I mean, it goes so far beyond even, you know, your specific discipline, um, this brainwashing, it's absolutely beyond belief. So, you know, <laughs> what do you, yeah, what, what do you say? And it's the way the industry has been set up. I mean, that's another thing that they've done well over the last hundred years is when science is funded by taxpayers' money, but they have to get these grants and other things like that. Well, um, you know, if you go and do a study for a year on something and you, you get to the point where you really didn't prove anything, well, sometimes those guys are kind of forced to say that they did because the next time you try and go get funding, and the person says, well, what kind of work have you done? I'm sure if you said, well, I spent the last year trying to do this and it didn't come out to anything, uh, those, that's not a good way to get a grant. That's not a good way to get money. But if you say, oh, I was just doing some research on these nanoparticles and I proved you know, this, well, then that's a better way to get you know, a funding. So it, it becomes a problem, um, a systematic problem, that is tough to, tough to fix because when it comes down to people making money, you know who should we be? Who should pay for scientific work? And you know, in my opinion, it should be uh, the collective people. If if we really want people out there studying these things who are specialists in these things, then it probably needs to come from the community. But then we need to have the ability to question the results, and that's what's not allowed. You can't. You're not allowed to question science. Well, there's there's a problem there. It's our money. We should be the first and foremost people to question things when we don't agree with the findings. And right now, that's not allowed. So systematically, they have created a system where we can't um, really object to some of the things that they say. You're just you're not allowed to. And things like refraction and some of these other things that are so cemented in people's mind, like it's an automatic. It has to be there. There's a 17% refraction, whether you like it or not. Well, when you call those things into question, people will just laugh at you. And you know that's certainly not the way I, at least for me, that I think it should go. Right. 
yeah, established science, so to speak. But uh, right. yeah, I agree with you. It's it's a messed up system. So you know, obviously, then w the way we deal with it is we continually point out the flaws with it and the deceptions in it, um, and uh, kind of move forward. So.